Yo, my name's GC. This show's weird. Let's talk about Tokiden 2. I've never done sequels to things covered on the show, except for that one retrospective series, which you should watch because it comes recommended by various individuals you might be familiar with. There's no hard rule about it, I've just never had a particular reason to. But in this case, I've got plenty, because Tokiden 2 has a really positive message that people should hear, and it has interesting ideas I'd like to see more of. Unfortunately, I haven't seen it getting much attention. Luckily, I'm happy to help. The Tokiden games are hunting games, monster hunting games. Except the monsters are called Oni, the hunters are called Slayers, and the hunting is set in a time-warped feudal Japan. But they're not centered around the slow, thoughtful gameplay Monster Hunter is known for. They're fast, they're aggressive. If you want to know more about the fundamentals, you can watch my video on Tokiden Kiwami. That's two plugs in less than a minute. This video is starting off great! But Tokiden 2 is an open-world hunting game. Rather than take a mission that then puts you in a closed-off map populated by tons of tiny baby demon monsters and one really big demon monster, Tokiden 2 has one big world that every demon monster inhabits. Different Oni populate the several regions and make their nests in places you'd expect to find them. The spider hangs out near water in highly vegetated areas. The lion's habitats are the flat even plains. The snake slash snail lady hangs out near old buildings? I guess that makes sense to somebody? These locations don't change, so it's still easy to find the specific kinds of monsters you want to fight, but with the bonus of being able to fight as many monsters you want without getting kicked back to the hub after each victory. Mission-based hunting is still in the game and sadly the only way to play with your friends, but the single player is focused on the world built in Tokiden 2. Your main objectives to advance the story take place in that open world alongside the many distractions that quickly become fun detours for you to indulge in. Side quests that often overlap or are on the way to where the story is taking you can be found all over the map and periodically spring up as the story advances. At some point you'll notice that the more Oni you get rid of in a specific region, the safer the supply routes in that region become. A neat way of tracking your exploration. The more places you find, the more Oni to kill. The more Oni you kill, the safer the entire region gets. While you're out doing quests and securing supply routes, you might be alerted to nearby joint operations where another slayer is in the process of carrying out their duties. Joining the fray, in turn, allows them to temporarily join your group after the fighting is over, adding a fifth member to an already decently sized party. And there's a cool twist on the chests you can find containing weapons and armor. These chests are connected to their counterparts in other players' worlds. You can leave a weapon or piece of armor you don't need inside your version of the chest, and it'll become the prize a different player finds in that chest in their own game. There's a couple other things to do out here, but it's these four that do the brunt of the legwork for this part of what Tokiden 2 is trying to share. All of these activities are about helping people, whether indirectly or being asked to do so. But the message here is not you should help people. No, 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 no. That's simple. That's easy. That's a platitude. Rather than look at what your character is doing, look at why. Let's be real here. It's not like these joint operations aren't being generated every time you step out onto the map. Your comrades are terrible at their job. For fuck's sake, Hajime, again with the imps. How many times do we gotta go over this? Stop eating on your patrols. They go after the crumbs. You complete joint operations because an extra slayer in the group is devastating against Oni. Because you might rescue an engineering or supply unit and get your smithing fees waived next time you build a new weapon. You do quests because they have rewards. You clear supply routes so that the shop back home can have more items in stock. It's not out of the kindness of your heart, or at least not entirely, and that's kind of okay. Obviously, expecting something in return for helping others is not something you should do or enforce, but here's an interesting question. Is helping others because you might get something out of it all that bad? The first time you help somebody out, sure, maybe it's pure and heroic, but then that little notification bar on the side of your screen starts to trickle whispers into your ear. Oh, look at that! It's almost enough for a whole set of armor! Wow, that's convenient! Perhaps there's... Other people that need your help? Hmm? Mr. Hero? 
When you get back to Maharoba Village to upgrade your equipment or change out your party members, the helping pays off in a different way. Killing those extra Oni you didn't have to might have helped unlock new Mitama or new Mitama abilities and definitely got you crafting materials to make things. It gets you the money you need to pay for blacksmithing and shop services. It lets you repair and upgrade your little robot friend that goes off to find you items and feed your tankos who accompany you as sidekicks that can purify Oni and resurrect you. It lets you bring back ingredients to the cook so you can pay for and eat better meals for better buffs. Heck, sometimes the activities overlap and you kill two birds with one stone, or in this case, two Oni with one slayer. When you're playing Tokiden 2, you're not helping these people out of a selfless desire. You're doing it because A, you need their services to keep fighting Oni, and B, because it gets you something you need. And that's fine. You don't need a reason to help others, but it's okay to have one, even if that reason is a little selfish. It might sound strange to hear someone embellish an otherwise incredibly run-of-the-mill series of actions in a video game, but context is important here. Togeden 2 doesn't deliver a specific message, but rather several that work off of one another. Before we get there, though, a reality check is in order. I realize that video games in real life are two different things. Helping others feels good, or at least it should, but in Togeden 2's case, that means fighting monsters needs to feel good. It's not exactly an encouraging message if your players aren't encouraged to try it out, now is it? <coughs> That's also kind of the most important part of a hunting game. You can relax. Fighting monsters in Tokiden 2 feels great, specifically because of all the improvements made to the combat. You see, the Oni are really big, at least as big as one macaroni grill. Toppling one over and getting to whale on its hard to reach spots is an achievement. But unless you're using a ranged weapon or a weapon that can gain lots of height, there's a lot of ankle biting involved. Tokiden 1 had a slight verticality issue, so Tokiden 2 takes a page out of a fellow hunting games book and introduces the demon hand. Basically a grappling hook that flings you at whichever part of the Oni you aim it at, meaning everybody can become a high flying acrobatic super jumping. You, you get what I'm talking about. You'd think it'd have a limited use for ranged fighters, but it gives ranged weapons the potential to be used like shotguns. It makes that player feel a lot more mobile and useful in the process. Togeden's combat has always focused on movement and speed, and the demon hand pushes it further in that direction. With this fast vertical element now a central part of Togeden's core gameplay, the Oni could also now be more mobile and bigger. That's right. Two macaroni grills. They didn't just come back bigger and scarier, no no, they came back smarter, varied, and more aggressive. Tokiden Kiwami tried to fix Tokiden 1's somewhat lackluster monster roster, which is a term I want to conventionalize because it's so fun to say, monster roster. But in most cases it was too late into the single player content. Most people probably never got there. Most people probably have responsibilities. Most people probably don't have 80 hours of their life to dump into a game like Tokiden. I do, though. For the sequel, the monster roster was remixed, and now those 60th hour Oni replace a lot of palette swaps. There's new Oni that fill in more of those spots too, and it's clear that Omega Force is trying to push further and further away from having too many reskinned Oni, but Tokiden 2 still has a considerable amount of recolors to deal with. This is still the weakest part of this series, and honestly, not surprising. Building a good monster roster takes a lot of time. More time than it takes to make a sequel. Togeden 2 manages to, at least, get the most out of its young lineup using careful organization. It's strange though, how they got rid of monsters that would have felt right at home with the better mobility. But to its credit, the new mechanics in place keep the Oni you can fight feeling fresh. Break an Oni's body part and you sever its physical form, revealing the soft, gummy spirit underneath. This means the Oni is going to get sloppy with its attack. Maybe it won't stick a landing, or maybe it'll lose its balance easier. Basic hunting game stuff. But with the demon hand, it's possible to sever an Oni's body part completely, preventing it from regenerating its spiritual form and permanently affecting its moveset in a drastically more severe way. Cut the legs off the manhunter and it'll sit on its abdomen and become a turret. Remove one of the Sucky Wings's 
wings and it'll fly lower to the ground. Some Oni parts are only breakable in this way after forcing it into an enraged state, but for others, breaking those parts early makes the second phase of the fight a lot easier. Depending on how well you fight it, you can fight the same Oni multiple times and not learn its full moveset until the third or fourth encounter. These are ways the Oni can make things different, but a great deal of variety in how you can equip your Slayer means that everyone, no matter the loadout, can add something different to the group. Time for some perspective. Every weapon from the first game has had their movesets expanded for greater utility, and two new weapons have been added, the Chain Whip and the Sword and Shield. I know, Sword and Shield, nothing special, right? But get this. Now that's 11 weapons, but what's more integral to good teamwork in Tokiden 2 is equipping the right Mitama. Mitama are the spirits of significant people from Japan's history and folklore, and this sounds familiar. Does this sound familiar to you guys? This sounds really familiar for some reason. There's a total of 300 Mitama! but they all fit into 11 types. These help define what kind of role you play during Oni fights, but how you perform that role is up to you and what Mitama you decide to put on. The one you set in the style slot gives you a set of active abilities that you can use during fights. Speed Mitama abilities increase movement speed, decrease stamina consumption, healing Mitama allow you to restore the health and stamina of your teammates, that sort of thing. But in the evasion slot, each Mitama type has a different kind of defensive ability that activates if a certain condition is met like getting invincibility for a short amount of time if you take damage that would otherwise kill you. And in the attack slot, they each give a different offensive ability you can use. My favorite one creates a copy of your Slayer that doubles up all your attacks. So we've got 11 weapons that match up to 3 different Mitama that can all be any of 11 different types. Wow, that's a lot of combinations. On each Mitama you end up using, there's a unique combination of boosts of which you can equip three for a total of nine. Your group can only have four people in it. It's the harsh reality that you cannot possibly fill every role on the team, and the unarguable truth that even four people can't fill every role on the team that delivers the next piece of Tokiden 2's message. It flips the first part over and makes us players the ones in need of assistance. You can't do everything by yourself. It's okay to ask for help. Conveniently for us, the second part of this also serves as a continuation of what we learned from Neo. It does not matter who you are or where you come from, what matters is your intent. Not your reason for it, but your determination to help as best as you can. Because in Tokiden, it doesn't matter what role you decide to play, it's a useful role. It will provide something that the other roles cannot. Again, on their own, these are all just empty platitudes. We've heard these all so many times before that there's no weight behind them. Now, without a new angle or an adhesive to bring to light something more specific that could resonate with the player. And Tokiden 2 uses its narrative to seal the deal. Small disclaimer. The lore of the Tokiden universe is a little weird and oddly extensive, so bear with me. Our story begins with our character leading a group of slayers during the Awakening, the name given to points in time when Oni invade the world in mass to consume it. At the most important moment of the battle, a mysterious force throws us 10 years into the future. Without your leadership, the Awakening was not prevented, the world has been devastated, and what little of humanity is left viciously fights for survival. This is the mistake your character lives with. Maybe a self-imposed one, but a failure in your past that you cannot change. And what's the first thing you do? You do the only thing you know how to do. You fight the Oni. You might not have been able to prevent the Awakening, but you can definitely prevent it from getting worse. Now that's your character, but almost every character in Tokiden 2 has a part of their past that they interpret as a failure, as a mistake. One of them is an ex-bandit. Another one considers her life forfeit to a curse she placed upon herself. And another haunted by a dark ultimatum she felt she chose poorly on. They all come from different places, both culturally and regionally, and it's a barrier at first. It's that sensation we've all felt before, that feeling that those around us don't understand our problems. And because of that, they refuse to ask each other for help. 
they try to solve these complicated problems alone and often find themselves in dangerous situations because of it. It's your persistence as a reliable force. That constant reminder that you're there to help, even if it's because you need your teammates at their best to fight the Oni, that they are able to move past it. That they realize they don't need to struggle with that weight so long as they have someone support them every now and then. If you put the pieces together, you find that behind these platitudes, is a very concentrated message. It's easy to tell people to move on from the mistakes of their past, but it isn't as simple to do. Some of us are afraid to ask for it, but it's okay to ask for help. It's okay if you can't do everything by yourself, even if it's something like tending to old wounds. And you don't need a reason to help those people, but it's okay if you do. It's okay if helping someone with their problems happens to benefit you in some way, if part of why you're helping comes from a selfish place. Hell, in some cases, that sense of mutual gain might make people feel better about asking. It doesn't matter who you are or why you're helping. It doesn't matter to the people that want to help you where you come from or what you need assistance with. All that should matter is that you're there, that you're asking or that you're helping, that you're showing the resolve to get it done. The truth is, everybody needs help once in a while, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. You might not find what I found in Togiden 2 to be as intense as I'm making it out to be, but even if you're not into the whole let's learn from this angle, it's still a good game. Togiden 2 is in almost every way better than the first. An open world in a hunting game is such a cool concept that turned out great here. The only downside to its implementation is that you can't use it in multiplayer. But playing with friends is still a great time because of how much more dynamic combat is now with the expanded movesets and demon hand mechanics. And the multiplayer on PC actually works this time around. Like with most hunting games, mileage may vary depending on how long your interest lasts. But with the encouraging amount of options and the emphasis on speed, you'll get tired of Tokiden 2 at a slower rate than most. You might even finish it before you start to feel that happening. The story is a lot shorter than the first, but it matches the pace of the gameplay and with it delivers a stronger message overall. The Tokiden series is quickly becoming one of my favorites and I'd like to see more. And that's all I've got today. Until next time, my name's GC. Remember that you are amazing and keep on playing positive.